Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for coming. I, when I hear from people like you, I get very excited and uh, enthusiastic because your passion is obvious and, uh, and uh, you're breaking a lot of barriers. I just wish our government was as nimble as you are because it needs to be. Obviously, we're not, and that's part of the problem. Um, I want to talk first of all, though, Mr. Reed, about the role that universities play. Uh, we're very fortunate, I think, in, uh, in Arizona, at least in my community, we have the University of Arizona, which just a year ago uh, uh, initiated Tech Launch Arizona and uh, has consolidated essentially the, the launch uh, offices from across the university into a really solid uh, uh, opportunity for helping university professors who are really good at research but not necessarily great at big building a business, commercializing their product. In the last uh, year alone, seven new businesses have come out of this and 15 patents were issued. So we're making progress. I guess I would like to ask you um, how, how and what we, do we need to do to better support our colleges and universities as they grow to begin to build this bridge between the research lab and commercial application? Yeah, so, so I, I'm a little bit familiar with that program at the University of Arizona, and yes, it is an amazing thing. Uh, there's another program that I'd love to point out that I think helps answer your question. Uh, you may be familiar with. It's called i uh, as in I-Corps, uh, C-O-R-P-S, and it's about innovation. And it's actually funded by the National Science Foundation. And uh, some of my colleagues at universities here in the Washington, D.C. area have led a nationwide effort. And, and what it essentially does is it brings the principles of the lean startup movement into university laboratories. Uh, and, it's, and it's amazing to watch the, the transformation. Y you mentioned how many scientists aren't great at business. That's no surprise to, to many of us, but that's a big surprise when the scientist learns it. Uh, and so through the i program, the scientists, the developers of this technology are paired up with business people and mentors. Um, but one of the most important things they do is they actually have to go and talk to customers. And that is a transformative experience for a scientist to actually find somebody that is willing to buy whatever it is that they think is the greatest technology in the world. And, uh, and so they learn a lot. And that's an incredibly powerful experience. So that program is relatively new. It's been on around maybe just one or two years. Um, but it's been expanding rapidly. Some of the federal labs in this area are beginning to adopt it as well. Um, so the i program is what I would absolutely say is a great example. Go ahead, please. I, I didn't know if raising your hand is the right thing. Um, so I have a lot of experience with this, uh, surprisingly. And um, so it's the Office of Technology Transfer. Every university is going to have an Office of Technology Transfer. And that, their job, their sole purpose is to get technology in the labs out uh, to real products, either through licensing, let's say license it to GE, or to start a company. Both good. Products get out there. It's fine. Um, but there's, there's some really good Office of Technology Transfer. MIT is an example. But most are really bad, really bad. And the federal government actually does have some bargaining power, right? Where do they get almost all their money? Y'all, from NI, NIH grants or a big one a lot of government grants. So what I would like to see is part of, let's bring NIH, National Institute of Health is a huge funder of research. And they fund this research and it creates really cool medical devices that never see the light of day because they're not, the universities are not graded on that, uh, on um, transferring and commercializing this technology. So what I want to see NIH do, for example, is when you submit a grant application, how good is your university at technology, technology transfer? Now, it should just be one little bit of the grading scheme for a grant. Um, but it could have a huge effect, even if it's just licensing. But that's good, too. That makes a lot of sense to me that you would have some it's incentive not. or push to, to make sure that you do that. Um, I appreciate your work in optics, by the way. We have a an optics cluster down in southern Arizona that we're very proud of and uh, come visit us sometime if you don't already know. About oh, I do. Arizona, uh, University of Arizona and Rochester are the two powerhouses in the world for optics. I hire, I've hired two people from Arizona for optics. They're great. No. 
Well, our graduate students are staying home and they're also going elsewhere. It's good to know. I, I know we're close to, I mean, exactly almost over time, but I just want to ask this question of as many of you as quickly as you can answer it. What can we do uh, in Congress to help you get uh, better access to capital? I mean, I think that's one of the biggest stumbling blocks I've heard uh, from your testimony. Just if you could each give a one or two sentence answer to that question, I'd appreciate it. Uh, yeah, mine's really simple. I mean, I think give resources to the organizations on the ground in the communities that we're working, because every community is different. You're, you guys are not likely to create one system that works for everyone. And where I've found the the finances so far have been the people that I knew already, and then they got hold of a grant that they could actually then turn and you know, give me access to. Sawyer? I would like to see the restrictions on SBA loans loosened. It's even tough to get an SBA loan, which is, I think, a bit silly. So um, we're even slightly profitable, and it's almost impossible for us to get an SBA loan. So I don't know who's getting them. Reed? Um, yeah, so there's something I have seen work well in North Carolina that I think the Federal Government might want to explore. It's a qualified business venture tax credit. And it, what it essentially does is if you invest as an angel investor or what have you in, in a qualified business venture, which uh, certain types of startups qualify, then you get tax breaks for that. And that multiplies the uh, or it, it, it leverages the uh, private investment. I think that should be expanded to other states and perhaps the Federal tax system as well. It actually, that is um, in the state of Kansas, the, the Kansas Angel Tax Credit, where if you invest up to $100,000, you get a $50,000 tax credit against your Kansas income. Um, that is a huge draw. And pretty much anyone in Kansas City that's a high growth startup moves and becomes a Kansas company because of it. And finally, Mr. Gill. Yeah, um, I, I definitely agree with the, the things that people have said here. I would add that um, the tax credits are, could be a very big thing. Uh, empowering companies on the ground and also giving R&D tax credits like Canada, for example, does. A lot of companies are moving out of Silicon Valley and moving to Toronto because they actually can write off all the R&D that they can do. Um, and so, and that's a wonderful thing. You provide great technology. If that's one thing that we could do, that would be a spectacular one. I think all of us in Congress have a responsibility to break through some of these barriers. We have a, a new company in Tucson, StrongWatch, that's developing surveillance uh, technology for border security. We have Syncardia to develop the artificial heart. We've got some great inventions all across this country. We need to find government both getting to help as well as getting out of the way. And I really appreciate what you've done. Keep on doing it and keep pushing us to do better. Thank you. I yield back.